Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well. OK, great. So I'm Varshi. Um, I lead the DevOps teams at Canonical. Um, you've heard a bit about Canonical, and I know a lot of you are not familiar with open source space or Ubuntu or Canonical. So I'll, I'm going to start with that. Uh, so what Canonical does is, Canonical is the parent company behind Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is one of our key products, but that's not the only <coughs> product. We have a lot of different things that we are working on in the open source space with the vision of making open source as easily accessible and as secure as possible. Um, my role and my teams, basically what we work on is uh, reducing the operations overhead for our internal IT operations teams. So your system administrators, your SRE teams, uh, we create software and we harness the power of Juju and Shams to reduce the operations work that these team, teams have to do and automate a lot of their workloads. Um, I live in Toronto, but I'm from Jaipur, um, so this is be a pleasure for me to be here so I can give you some tips and help you with technical challenges, Arya, if needed. Um, right, so uh, let's just, uh, I'm curious about the crowd here, so how many of you are from Jaipur? Uh, maybe a show of hands. Okay, I was actually expecting a lot more. Um, so it's your responsibility to take your colleagues out and have them explore this beautiful city. I do hope the day three trip happens and you get to see all of the history and uh, great food and shopping that Jaipur has. And after this talk, if you need any recommendations, do reach out to me. I'll be here for the next couple of days. Um, before we start talking about Juju and Charms, um, it's important to understand the problem space that we are operating in on why these tools even came into existence. Um, so right now is in a very exciting time. In open source, there is just no lack of choice that's here. We have so many large companies and industries investing in building open source. Um, so if you need a database, whether it's a SQL or a NoSQL, a graph or a time series database, you have an open source version available. And not just any version, that they are sometimes much better than the paid and proprietary versions. So the MySQL, Postgres, all of those databases that are available. And that's not just in the database space. Um, it's everywhere. So from Linux to container tech, uh, to machine learning, so a lot of the new machine learning loads, big data, databases, like I said, observability, uh, languages, runtimes, you name it, and there is an open source version that's available for that. Um, so the problem is not that um, we have a lack of open source solutions. Uh, we have, uh, for every single thing that you can imagine, there is an open source solution available. So the problem that we are targeting is uh, the operations and the challenges of complexity of these applications. So in the modern environments, uh, it's very rare that you would be deploying an application in isolation. For the most part, your application would be integrated with a lot of other different applications, and that's where the challenges start. Um, you can imagine that if you're deploying a simple web application, you might need a database with it. You might need some sort of a matrix or a logging solution with it. Um, if you want to put it behind a single sign-on, you might need that integration. If you want to send mails using that, you might need a mail server. So you need a lot of different integrations to make your application work. And um, that just, just a second. Yeah, so that just, the problem just in, keeps increasing. And if you think about deploying something like OpenStack, which by the way, this is uh, a really old picture of the OpenStack architecture, and OpenStack is a cloud. Um, so if you start thinking about deploying infrastructure rather than just applications, the problems keep increasing and the complexity increases by a hundredfold. And now this is just a single cloud. Imagine you're living in a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud world where you have your caching deployed on AWS, you have your applications deployed on your private cloud or bare metals, um, you have uh, uh, some of uh, your other applications deployed on a Google Cloud. So you are, if you are working in a hybrid cloud space, the problem increases even more. Um, 
And somehow, if you figure that all of that out, so th if you figure the day zero or day one of creating these applications, deploying these infrastructure, deploying all of these applications together, the work is not over. It, at this point, you have just deployed stuff, but you still have a lot of day in operations pending. So you have to maintain these applications. Think about if you have to run upgrades, if you want to uh, run, ha add security patches to these applications in future, all of those constitute the day in operations. So somebody would have to understand that, update your uh, certificates is also an example, and do that at a regular period beyond just deploying it. And that's where um, you might be thinking like, OK, uh, do we not have existing open source solutions to target that? Uh, you might be familiar with things like Terraform or Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, which all of these are really great solutions, but they mostly target the day zero deployment or configuration of applications um, so and have their pros and cons in deploying that. In fact, we do have a Terraform provider or support for Terraform in Juju, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, but most of these solutions are just configuration management tools rather than modeling your applications the right way uh, in, a, in a way that you are able to operate them much easily. So that's where Juju comes in, or the uh, main core uh, need of Juju comes in. So Juju allows you to deploy any application. It could be a web application, a database. It could be cost or your observability stack, identity. It allows you to deploy any kind of an, of an application on any at any scale. So you could be a very small business with less than 10 people, or you could be a large organization with over 5,000 folks. We can, Juju can work on that scale. So you as uh, an operation, operational engineer do not have to worry about that. Juju takes care of the scale on any platform and at any substrate. So what any platform means is it is truly multi-cloud. There is true portability. So between AWS, Google Cloud, or any of the public clouds, or your bare metal, or your private servers, or Kubernetes, or any of the container tech, Juju allows you to deploy it on any substrate. Um, it has a common language. It is one of the only tools of its kind that allows you to deploy, integrate, and applications over uh, all of these different bare metal Kubernetes and VMs with a consistent UX. So why that is huge is, um, so instead of you having to figure out how to deploy something on AWS versus GCP, you now only have to learn a single set of tools. So once you understand how Juju works, once you get comfortable with the language of Juju, that's the only language you will need. A Juju deploy of an application A works uh, with the same command on uh, AWS versus GCP. So you don't have that overhead of figuring out how things work on different substrates. Um, as long as you understand Juju, it takes care of that. Uh, you can use Juju to deploy um, a VM. You can use it to deploy Kubernetes. You can use it to deploy your infrastructure. And once your infrastructure is deployed, you can then use Juju to compose your applications and deploy those as well. Um, the way that applications get deployed on Juju is using charms or charmed operators. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes operator concept, it's an adjacent concept to this. Um, so you can use Juju charms to deploy these applications and configure it. And here is where you can define the actions. So these are um, on a charmed operator. Let's say you are deploying WordPress as an example. Uh, you might want to upgrade your application later on. You might want to add a user or add an admin, have all of these different things that you need at a uh, day thousand running of the application. And you can define those as actions on the operator. Um, so when you interact with Juju CLI, you just have to give it a command of Juju upgrade this application. And under, under the hood, Juju takes care of, of that. So we now understand that uh, Juju is a tool that you can be used to deploy and uh, configure and manage and maintain applications. So it's basically uh, an open source modeling tool. Um, what it does is um, it deploys your applications in a logical way um, that is easy uh, for you to uh, deploy across multiple clouds. 
Um, the main brain of Juju is its controller. So your controller is a management no a node which manages the information flow between your <coughs> applications and your models and different clouds. Um, how you deploy uh, Juju is you'll have, you always deploy Juju in different models. A model is an abstraction uh, that holds applications or your charmed operators. Your controller would be deployed on a separate model. So you'll have a model that deploys your controller, which then interacts with all of your different models. You can deploy a model on Kubernetes, or you can deploy a model on VM. Um, so how that's helpful is now, instead of thinking about business decisions at an application level, you can think about them at the model level. So you can have logical groupings of applications that are deployed. So you can have your databases deployed in a separate model. You can have your observability deployed in a separate model. And you can link them together. You can have different access controls for different models. So let's say you want to deploy a code on either development or production, so you can have different sort of access controls defined for that. Um, and Juju allows you to have th those abstractions in place. It's also repeatable, so once you have a model definition that is set in, so it's a, a rich language definition, it's ba a basic uh, uh, simple text file where you define what you want in your model, what is the storage that you need, the network space that you need, what is the access that you need, and you can define it per model, and then um, you can you export out that definition, and then that is repeatable and usable for other uh, models that you want to create as well. So this is how a model would typically look like in Juju. It's a collection of applications that are linked together. Um, so these relations are called integrations in Juju. And we have a lot of these different majorly used um, uh, applications available as charms on Charm Hub. So if you want to see what's already available, so things like databases are already available, observability, we are working on identity. We are continuously adding more and more open source applications as charms on Charm Hub. So you can go to uh, Charm uh, Hub. It's basically a store. So if you're familiar with Snap Store, it's similar to that. But it just holds all of the charmed operators that you can deploy on Juju. So this is what a typical Juju deployment of an application would look like. So on a single unit, you would have your application deployed along with an operator. So what is a charmed operator? It is, um, like I said, for uh, any application, if you pick WordPress again, you would have a, a lot of niche SRE knowledge that's needed to operate that application. And that's where charms come in. They hold all of the uh, niche operations knowledge that are required to operate that charm in a production setting. So how to install and configure and remove and scale. All of that is hold in packaged ops code. Um, it's clean Python code um, that we have charms in. Um, so how this would work is you can interact with Juju using a CLI. There is also a graphical user interface if you want to use that. In the CLI, you would type a command like, uh, let's say this is an already deployed application. You would type a command for upgrading that application. It will then go to controller. So controller has an API service that intercepts that command. And then it will, on the back end, uh, check with the database on whether there is, has been a state change for that application. Once it determines, OK, this is the state change and this is a command we have to run, it will emit an event. So that event is polled by the agent that is installed on the Juju unit. So every unit has its own Juju agent installed. Similarly, a model has an agent installed. And you have your controller deployed on a model. So the controller keeps in contact with all of the agents that are deployed on uh, your units and models. And that's how the state of all of your applications and your, on, and your, your infrastructure is kept in sync. Um, so your agent on the unit is going to pull for events from the controller. As soon as it sees, oh, there is a new event for me, and I have to upgrade this application, it will pass it along to the operator, which will actually do the upgrade and uh, upgrade the application. So as a operator, uh, as, a, as somebody who's operating this entire infrastructure, you don't have to uh, worry about um, how the application is going to get upgraded. All of that is encoded in the charm operator code. 
So we talked a bit about the charm already. Um, so charms, like I mentioned, are packaged ops code. Um, so anything that you need to operate that application and manage it and configure it the right way is inside a charm. It maintains the entire life cycle of your application. So from your installation to configuration, updates, removing, scaling out your application. It allows you to define actions on your uh, for your application. So it could be um, log dumps or health checks or adding users or backups and restores the standard actions. So if you have uh, a database charm, um, I'm not sure if you, anybody here has deployed a database before, but there are a lot of things you have to think about. You have to think about the storage. You have to think about um, the connection settings on connection pooling, how much do you allow, how much real estate that you allow to your database. Um, so those, all of that configuration is handled inside the charm. Uh, you can also integrate with other charms that are already available in the store. Uh, so like I said, we have a large team at Canonical working at building these operators for most of the commonly used uh, open source applications. So you, are, you can find really good charmed operators for some of these applications already. Uh, so if you're building application A, you might we already have charms for major technologies that you can use, and Juju allows you to define integrations to that. So if your application needs an um, LDAP or SAML or uh, databases, like I said, you can just define that inside your charm and uh, Juju takes care of that integration. Right, so that that is all great. Um, and you have Juju now, we understand that it can help with operations, it can help reduce the operations overhead. But how does that help you as an application developer? Um, so I, we realized uh, a couple of years ago that there is still a blocker in the community for using these tools because a lot of times you're not really worried ab about operations. You don't want to care about those. As an application developer, you're worried about your application. So how do you, you use the Juju Juju functionality and all the Juju goodness uh, without having to learn the tool in depth and or without having to charm your application. Um, so we added support for certain frameworks inside Juju. So right now we have support for Flask applications. So if you are a Python Flask developer, we can create a charm for you automatically. And I'll just give you a demo of that. Um, but this, uh, and we are planning on adding uh, support for Go and Fast API and Django uh, in the next couple of months, um, and more frameworks as they come in. Uh, so let's say you have a Flask application and you want to run it on Kubernetes. Um, what are your options? So you have Helm charts, which basically allow you to create a deployment definition for your application, uh, but that's very manual, you have to figure out how to configure it, how to get a Docker image created. You have a lot of different uh, infrastructure pieces you have to understand there. Uh, the other option is using a proprietary PaaS solution, so platform as a service solution. Uh, something like Fly.io or Pivotal Cloud Foundry or AWS or a GCP, you, you can use a cloud solution where it takes care of your ingress and DNS and observability and monitoring and all of that, and you can just care about your application but we all know that's not free, it's paid, uh, it's not available for everyone, the source code is not available, so you don't really know what it's doing behind the hood. Um, and the third solution is to use the new tooling that we have created. So it's a Juju Ops tooling. Um, and how you do that is, like, this is a very basic Flask application. It's a simple Hello World application in Flask. Um, there are uh, there is very good documentation around it that's been published too, and I'll give share a link to. Right here, they just have a single root route that if you go to that uh, route, it will just print out a hello world. You can use this tooling for any complex application as well. So it's just we wanted to keep it simple for the presentation. Um, if you have your application, the first step before you deploy it is to create a deployment artifact for it or an OCI image for it. For that, we will be using a tool called Rockcraft. Um, so Rockcraft is, uh, a, an, again, an open source tool that you can use to create and manipulate OCI images. Um, you can use Rockcraft to also define exactly what you want in your image, reduce the attack surface of that image by uh, chiseling that. 
Um, so once you have Rockcraft installed, they, you just need two commands to get your OCI image or get a deployable artifact out of it. So if you run Rockcraft in it with the flag profile flask framework, it will generate a YAML file for you um, where you can change things like name or version of the file or if you want to add some specific files in your image or remove specific files from, from your image, you can do that and then you run a simple pack command and that's it. You can, you'll get a deployable image that you can then use any tool to deploy that. Right. So here we are starting with that Flask image, uh, Flask uh, application. So you can see that the, that's a basic app.py, the same as I showed earlier. It's a hello world. We are just running it here to see whether it works by running a Flask run and curling it. Once you curl the local host, you see that it's working and printing out a hello world uh, there. Um, so we'll kill this server and start with our actual Rockcraft version. So we are checking whether Rockcraft is deployed. Here it is. You can use the OCI code for a detailed um, tutorial of that uh, if you want to. Um, and I, I think we can also share the slides later. Uh, so the first step is initializing it. So once you initialize it, it has created a Rockcraft YAML for you. And then we, you just run a pack command. You don't really have to edit other YAML if you don't want to. Um, when you run the pack, you see that it has generated an OCI archi archive for you. So the rock that it's generated, you can then use it and um, you can test it uh, with a Scopia tool, which we'll do in a minute. Um, so here, what's interesting is you don't have to use this rock. You can also go in the Rockcraft YAML file and remove certain packages, reduce the size of the image. You can chisel the image to, to be uh, for your use cases. So if I, like I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, we are using Scopio to create a local Docker registry so that you can test your um, the rock that was created. So we are just checking whether the Docker image is there, it's there, and by running a Docker run command, um, you can again curl it and it will print out the hello world. So what we have just do done here right now is we have taken your source, so it could be a GitHub image, uh, GitHub rep repository link. Uh, you, we can, uh, from your source now, we have gotten to an image file. Um, at this point, you can decide to deploy it using any of the different software that's available. You can use a PaaS if you want to. You can use a CI/CD tool, or you can deploy it by yourself or on bare metal or whatever you want. Or you can use the Juju tooling to do the next steps and actually get it deployed using Juju as well. Um, so what that looks like is now that you have an image, you also need a charm or an operator um, for that application to be so that it can be deployed on Juju. So to generate that charm, we have added tooling inside Charmcraft. Charmcraft is similar to Rockcraft, but instead of generating OCI images, it generates charmed operators. Um, so if you, uh, similar to Rockcraft, you'll have to install Charmcraft. Once you have installed Charmcraft, you can just do an init again. So it, the experience, the user experience is very similar. So you can run a Charmcraft init with profile flask framework, and that will generate a Charmcraft YAML for you again, which you can edit. You can add uh, integrations in there. For uh, uh, an example, if you wanted a database integration, you can define that in the YAML file and run in a fetch lips, which just fetches all of the libraries and changes you have made in your Charmcraft YAML. And once you run a pack, it just generates the charm for you. So you only have to care about three commands after installing Charmcraft, an init, init command, a fetch lips command, and a pack command. And that generates a deployable charm on Juju, which then on Juju, you can just add a model and uh, deploy your charm along with your image, um, and then start using other integrations that Juju provides. So let's see how that would look. Um, so we've changed that uh, initial Hello World Flask application a bit, um, and we are going to add a Postgres integration in it now. So your requirements.txt would have the Flask and uh, Psycop G2 library, which is the commonly used library for Postgres um, in, Py in Python Flask world. Uh, so we, this is just showing the requirements.txt and the changes that you will have there. Uh, then if we look at app.py, 
Um, so you will see that we have uh, changed our root route to add uh, connection to our database. So it's a very simple application. It's just saving how many visitors um, are visiting a particular link. So it's just going to add the timestamp and the user ID in your database. And we have added a visitor's endpoint that just prints out the count of the users on the screen. Uh, so very simple application ju that just connects to a database um, and has two endpoints. Uh, because we have the database connection, we also need a migrate.py, which uh, holds your creation of the table and how uh, the table should be created in the database. Um, so this is an additional file. Uh, since you have a database connection and an additional file, we would have to add that inside a Rockcraft image. Um, and I'll show it to you in a minute. So again, you are running a Rockcraft init profile flask framework inside the folder that holds your entire project. Uh, once you run that, it has created a YAML file. Uh, this is the YAML file that's generated. So you can change the version here because we have added more things to our initial image. Um, you can also add um, the additional file, the migrate.py for your database in here. All of that is commented out. And so if you see the actual generated YAML file, you can just un uncomment stuff in there, and that should work. Um, so now that you've changed things in Rockcraft YAML, is it, yeah, it's still working. So now that you've changed the things in Rockcraft YAML, you can do Rockcraft pack, and that would generate your OCI image. Um, and then you can also check it with Scopio uh, and move it uh, to a local Docker registry. And the next step is creating the charm. So you'll recreate a directory for the charm. You will CD inside that directory. Then you'll run a charmcraft init command with a Flask framework profile. And that will generate the YAML file like I'd mentioned earlier. Right. So if you go inside the YAML file, again, there are a few things that you can change. The name, version, uh, you can ch add a description here. Here is where you will add all of your integrations. So if it's, it's an ingress or a, a postgres or a observability or all of those integrations, you can add in here. So what your application talks to, you can define that in this YAML file. Um, so I, we have added um, a definition for the postgres here so that the charm is able to talk to postgres in the end. So once you make that change, you can then run your fetch lips command, which will fetch all of the libraries that you need uh, for this charm to be working. Uh, so it fetches your um, observability data uh, and uh, Grafana, Loki, data platform, Redis, all of the commonly used libraries for, uh, for your charms. Uh, when you run a pack command, it will generate your charm. Um, and so you don't really have to create it yourself. Once the charm is generated, um, you can then use it to deploy, be deployed on Juju and integrate it with other applications. Right. Um, so now that we have our charm, we have our image, we can just deploy it using Juju. So here we are adding a model called Flask Hello World. So it's a basic Juju model. We're creating a new model. Um, and then we are deploying our uh, generated charm. And here, the resource flask app image is the new image, the OCI image we just generated using Rockcraft. Um, once that's done, Juju would start deploying all of the applications and integrations you have defined in there. Um, once you have deployed the charm, you can then you deploy other charms. So since we had defined the Postgres charm as something we wanted for this, we have deployed a Postgres charm. Now you can just use a juju integrate command to link your application and Postgres together. Um, so when you use a juju integrate, it automatically does everything that's needed for your application to talk to your database. Um, then we are also deploying an ingress here, so nginx ingress. Again, you deploy the ingress. Um, so that's what we're trying to test. Uh, so you see that it prints hello world, so the, our endpoint is working. We also added a visitor's endpoint, if you remember. So if you go to the visitor's endpoint, it should show you that it was accessed one time. So if you access it again, it should update the visitor's endpoint to be twice. Um, so basically, you can see that the application is working. You had a very few number of commands to do that got you from your source to deployment. Um, so this is 
how it, it actually does the deployments um, in Juju. Um, so you, as a user, are only responsible for your application. So you have to just be responsible for your source code. Uh, the new tooling that we have created would generate the OCI image and operator for your application. That then can be used on Juju and integrated with a lot of different charms and applications that are in there. Um, so you don't have to think about uh, learning Juju as such, which I, by the way, I do recommend. You should go through Juju and learn it and learn how to create charms as well. Uh, but this gives you a very easy pathway to starting with using all of this ecosystem and learning about it. So that's all I had for today. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know we are running late. So for any questions, I'll be here for the next couple of days so you can reach out to me. Um, if you're interested in this space and would want to contribute, uh, we have a Matrix channel as well. Um, so you can just go to that or you can just reach out to me directly. Thank you so much. Um, have a good day.